Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Irene Nokon, and I am on the large customer sales team out of San Francisco. I'm here today to introduce Chef Jason Halverson, formerly the sous chef of Michael Minna. He is now the executive chef at two San Francisco restaurants, Stone's Throw in Russian Hill and Trestle in Jackson Square. So please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome, thank you for having us. Uh, super exciting. Um, we're gonna make a pasta dish. Uh, pasta really makes me happy. Um, it's a fun dish uh, that really just um, includes things that I like. Okay, and that's what's fun about cooking for me, where you get to include things that you like. If you like something, you add more of it. If you don't like something, keep it out of there. Um, which makes it really fun. So uh, what we're making is a squid ink conchile. So conchile being the shape of the pasta, uh, squid ink being the base or the flavor, or the coloring of what we're making. Um, but to start, we're gonna make the sauce. So the sauce itself uh, is a shellfish and caper sauce. It's slightly spicy. Uh, the whole dish is slightly spicy. There's a lot of acid. Uh, it's really slightly rich, um, which makes it a lot of fun. So uh, to start, um, in a pan. One thing that we've done already is we've cooked off mussels and clams. If anybody hasn't ever cooked mussels and clams, uh, what we really did is we're using it for the juice and we're gonna use the clams and mussels later. Uh, but basically we had a pan uh, get really hot. Uh, we added the mussels and the clams, uh, covered them in white wine, covered the pot. And what happens is they'll steam open, uh, letting, out, or letting out a lot of their liquid, um, which is a great base for a sauce which you'll see how we'll use it here in a second. So, trying to figure out how to use this fancy mm -hmm. stove. So what we have, a uh, smaller pot, a um, little bit of oil. What we're gonna do is, to the base of this, start by sweating out some onions. We're gonna try to make these translucent. Uh, you'll see, I guess in my style of cooking, onions are used as a base for a lot of things. Uh, it's just a great foundation. You'll get a lot of nice flavor out of this. I also like how they smell, which is weird. So we'll let that kind of start off. Um, other ingredients in the sauce itself um, are capers. Capers for me add a, a saltiness, which I really like, uh, without adding like just a handful or a big pinch of salt. It actually adds a flavor, uh, which is, has its own, again, salinity. Uh, we'll have sliced garlic, Again, the spicy component to it uh, is uh, a piri piri chili. It's pretty spicy. It's a North African chili. Uh, this one happens to be dried. Um, and for any reason you can't find these, uh, the, like a chili flake, again, is a great substitution. Um, what's fun, again, about this is if you're a fan of something spicy, go ahead, get crazy with it. Use a lot. Um, but if you're kind of timid about it, shy away. It's kind of making it what you want. So. We're gonna do is take, add some sliced garlic. And more or less kind of seeing fit to you. We're gonna take a couple of these piri piris. If you use these, make sure to wash your hands after. Don't touch your face, don't do anything else. Just wash your hands. And with these, I'm just about adding, or I'm gonna add four or five of these. You can always add more, it's hard to take it away. So, kind of a fun note with that. Uh, capers, capers themselves um, are gonna be the main sole component, so I actually enjoy quite a few of that in there. And pretty soon you should be able to start smelling this. How do you go about finding quality shellfish, like the ones you're using here today? There's a lot of trust. We have like uh, fish purveyors, uh -huh. and you kind of just build this trust on what they're getting and who they're getting it from, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like, like a bad relationship, <laughs> <laughs> where like you always want to trust that they're gonna get you the best. And they usually do, but those times where if you run into somebody that gets you just bad shellfish, it's really bad. 
you know, stay away from it. I tend not to try to use them anymore. So as you guys can see, or I don't know if you guys can see, it's really starting just to uh, cook really fast. Uh, the onions are translucent, the garlic has a smell. Um, next thing. We have a little extra white wine. So white wine, you really want something that's um, not sweet. I like acid wines. Uh, you're starting to look at even the style of like a Chardonnay or um, Sauvignon Blanc, those kind of things. Again, just kind of trying to stay away from sweetness. And what you're going to let this do is now come up to a boil. Really what you're trying to do is burn out that raw alcohol. Either that or you're going to get that flavor. You may get drunk. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but the idea is just to burn out that alcohol. So that's up to a boil now. Uh, the last thing we're going to add to this sauce before we start on the rest of it, um, again, is all the liquor uh, from cooking the mussels and clams. Um, when you're cooking your mussels and clams, again, save the juice. It's really good. Uh, one thing you want to do is, before you cook your shellfish, try to soak it in water or let them kind of purge out any extra sediment that's in there. All right, then you're going to end up with something really gritty. Uh, and after that, after we cook it, we also strain it again just to make sure there's no grit. So I'll add that in. What was that? Just the wine, or just uh, the same wine that we use for the sauce. So. No water. Water X for me is like, it's always great to have and use when you're cooking. Uh, it's kind of a, it dilutes flavors. So you're going to have to cook something a little bit longer just to, to make that happen. So again, literally, we're just going to let this come up to, uh, come up to a boil. We'll turn it down. You just really want to kind of let these flavors come together. It takes about 10, 15 minutes uh, in a batch about this size. So um, give it a taste. Make sure it's what you want. The next thing we're going to make is uh, the pasta. So. Um, anybody ever made pasta? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of fun. I love making pasta. Um, the pasta we're gonna make, no eggs. Okay, so really kind of a, a hand rolled style pasta dough. Uh, what we have here um, in the bowl, two different flours. We have uh, double O flour and extra fancy durum. So the combination, what you'll see, just makes for a different texture of pasta. Uh, we like this one really dense because what happens when you cook it. Uh, especially in the sauce, it starts to absorb the, or absorb the sauce, just kind of making things taste better. Um, with that, what we have here is a combination of water, just like we talked about, and uh, squid ink. Okay, squid ink, not a lot of flavor necessarily in it. You're not going to necessarily get this super brininess, but uh, you definitely get this color, which kind of you associate with. So um, more so just going to add all these together. Is there a reason why you prefer to add the squid ink with the pasta versus in the sauce? I like, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, when I'm eating it, I've had bad experiences where I eat it as a sauce, and then for some reason I smile and I have black teeth. Oh, um, okay. Not so hot. <laughs> it gets kind of weird. Uh, I look like, I look like that guy, um, yeah. which is no fun. Um, so it actually kind of helps tame the whole, I guess, identity of the squid ink. So I'm gonna kind of cheat here. Uh, we're going to use the uh, KitchenAid. Um, this is, we're going to start with the paddle. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, more so just to kind of bring the dough together. And for those who don't know, um, what is double O flour and where can you get that? You can get it. Most of these ingredients you'll be able to find really uh, easily at like a Whole Foods uh, readily available. It's an extra milled flour. Um, it has a different gluten and different absorption rate than something like an AP flour. You can absolutely make it with that. Uh, this just helps with, again, the textures, the density, things like that. So, so let's see if I can. I've also found it at a Whole Foods. Obviously, we have kind of our own purveyor for it, but in the uh, for a small amounts instead of buying a huge jar, I've definitely seen it. Um, at a Whole Foods for sure. So. And for those who didn't hear the question, it was where do you source the squid ink? I'll hand that to you. This is great. In case you guys are wondering, this is Ryan over here. He usually tells me what to do. Um, so this is kind of nice. 
Is he with you in the kitchen too? He's usually yelling at me in the yeah. kitchen. Yeah. But. <laughs> So really what's going to happen here is this dough is going to come together. Um, if anybody, again, has made dough, I'm going to try to churn it somehow. I'm looking at the screen back there. Um, usually a dough will come together really fast. With this one, with no egg, you really actually want it as dry as possible. It becomes really difficult to work with um, when it's super dry, but the outcome is way better. Uh, obviously, if you add too much water, it just becomes really elasticy and kind of a mess. Um, What's fun about these pastas is they hold their shape really well um, when the texture is right. So that's kind of what we're looking for. So this is actually going to take a little while. Um, it will come together. That's what it does. Um, but to kind of move with it, what we've done is actually made the pasta itself. It's a nice big black sheet of pasta. Started this week. We're fortunate to have a pasta machine, uh, which makes working with pasta a little bit easier. And what we've done is we've just rolled it out into a sheet. So rolled out to, say, just over an eighth of an inch. And then what we do is we just cut little squares. It's fun. Um, one of the reasons I like making pasta is there are so many different shapes you can kind of go with. Even if it's not really a shape, you made it yourself, so it's kind of cool. It's organic. So just cutting into little squares. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a little gnocchi board uh, to kind of make a shape. Which you can find at most places, Williams Sonoma, Sur La Table, Amazon, all those places you can find them. Um, as you guys can tell, this one's been used just a little bit. Makes a lot of pasta. Uh, you get a lot of ridge, you get ridges out of this. You can start to make shapes. Um, so what we do is, with it being somewhat of a square, uh, we'll aim at rolling from corner to corner. So all you're going to do is push and kind of roll, which is fun for this shape. So push and roll. And that's kind of what you end up with. I got lucky on that one. You made that look fancy so fast. I did. <laughs> I got lucky. So really, again, you can make all sorts of shapes. Uh, if it comes to being where you don't have one of these, it's not going to be something where you can't make this pasta. If you have a counter, which I hope most of you guys do, uh, <laughs> you're making the pasta somehow, um, roll it straight on the board. You're not going to really lose much. It's just kind of fun. Um, Really just kind of build, I guess, your repertoire of pasta making. Use a fork, use absolutely. A fork, yeah. If you guys didn't hear, uh, suggestion was to use a fork. Italian grandmothers use forks. I love Italian grandmothers. And they make really good pasta. So absolutely go for it. Um, that's what you can do. What's fun is in the case of what you'll see with this dish is if you're going to have friends over, you can make most of this dish all in advance. It becomes really easy. Um, almost feel like a Sara Lee or something like that, trying to tell you guys how to do this. Um, but feel free to make the pasta ahead and uh, just to be ready. So with this pasta, we'll have a pot of boiling water, which we don't have set up here. We made pasta already. Um, make sure it's up to a boil, lightly seasoned with salt. Uh, and the reason I say lightly seasoned is because the sauce itself is going to have salt. Again, you can always add salt. You just don't want to hit that point of something being salty. Um, you'll boil it for about three minutes. Still have a little bit, it'll be al dente, you'll still have a little bit of a bite. Um, just kind of adding to the right texture for this dish. So basically after you're done blanching the pasta, see where we're at here. This is what it looks like. So I mean a nice sturdy pasta. Uh, really, it's what it is, so. We'll start that. Get this out of the way. Um, again, being a shellfish pasta, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys all the seafoods that we use. I love seafood. Anybody here allergic to seafood? I hope not. <laughs> Might not like me. So um, again, to start mussels and clams, we cook them in white wine. This is exactly what we use for the sauce. Uh, Chef Didi back there actually did a great job of cooking the pasta or the. Uh, 
the shellfish, thank you for doing that. I uh, appreciate it. So again, it's covered, or a hot pan, all the shellfish, white wine, it's covered. You're just gonna wait till they open. That's it, they're ready to go at that point. Um, after that, we separated it from the liquid, and all we're gonna do is take them out of the shell. If, they, uh, if they're not open, don't try to fight them open. If everything else is open, don't try to um, break them open to get it out. That's not necessarily a good sign of a, of a good shellfish. So that was the mussels. The clams, the exact same thing. Just kind of pulling these guys out. There we go. So we have that. Don't know why I did this. But everything can kind of go in the same bowl. It's all going to go to the same place anyways. So then after that, we have our calamari. I love calamari. I can eat it fried, baked, fried again. Uh, <laughs> love this stuff. Um, and again, with this, make it as you see fit. With this, we're going to just do rings. It's pretty straightforward. Just cutting straight across. Nothing fancy with this. You can absolutely get fancy. Um, again, another way too, you don't have calamari, uh, calamari steak. You know what I mean? The, the, the possibilities are pretty endless. Kind of based on what you have, what you want to eat. We've done this version of a, or this dish with a version of lobster before. It's, uh, that was super fancy, especially for pasta. And we'll do one more. Just make, ooh, good. We usually do. Um, they're fun to throw in there. They're just kind of waving all around, yeah. which is fun. But uh, just in this, or in this instance, we don't happen to have them. So um, another one of my favorites, shrimp. I love shrimp. We won't even talk about fried or anything again. <laughs> That's a given. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just curious about your restaurants. So you've got a couple. Um, what's the difference? Ooh, Ryan, you want to take <laughs> that one over? <laughs> sure. This is perfect. Um, I don't know how many people have been up to the city or been to Stone's Throw. Stone's Throw was our first restaurant um, when we both were at Michael Mina in different situations and capacities, we decided to go open that. Um, think of it if you took a Michael Mina style restaurant and plopped it into a neighborhood. Uh, a little more affordable, uh, not as complicated, a little more comfortable in the style of environment and service. Um, had that for about a year and a half and then decided to open a second restaurant. So Trestle has been open for maybe four months now. Um, completely shifted directions on that, and that is a prefix three-course menu for $35. It's the only thing we offer um, where you get a choice between two items on each course. You can add a pasta course if you want for 10 bucks. Um, but similar style, I mean, his food has, a, it's got a style. Uh, you will recognize if you come to one or the other restaurant, there is a stylistic similarity between the two. Stone's Throw affords us a little more complexity in dishes. We have more staff, we have more space, um, a larger menu so we can do things that are a little more complicated. Also, the price difference helps when you charge $35, you're kind of a little restricted in what you can do. Um, but you'll see, you'll see the same thought process behind the food, the service, the experience at both spots. And we're opening another restaurant at the end of the year. So we're staying busy. Yay. Exciting. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, we're sharing, we're sharing, oh, the question is what's the concept of the third restaurant? We're sharing high level details. Um, <laughs> yes, so it's uh, at the 100 Van Ness building, which used to be the old AAA headquarters. It's on the corner of Van Ness and Hayes, almost like right next to Van Ness and Market. Um, and we're doing two concepts in there. One is gonna be a cafe and a sandwich shop. Um, so we're partnering with a coffee roaster from Los Angeles called La Mill, um, doing an interesting coffee program, tea program, and then kind of artisanal sandwiches. We've, we've been running one of them on Uber Eats, actually. Just recently, we do a chicken parm sandwich. Uh, that's pretty awesome. 
And then the other is going to be kind of a hybrid between fine dining and fast casual service. It's no reservations. Um, there's some interesting tech components we're trying to, to put into it. Um, and you should get the feel like you're at one of our restaurants, but without the same sequence of service in a two hour setting. Like you should be able to get in and out. You're in the theater area. You're next to the Civic Center. Um, so that's the general gist of where it's going. Probably in a few weeks, we'll announce a little bit more. I like your style. <laughs> I remember reading that there was a sort of charity component to Stone's Throw that you were encouraging patrons to come and bring canned food in. Do you guys still do that? We do. So are you ready to keep going with the dish? I don't want to keep going. <laughs> here and look good. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, so from kind of month two on when we started Stone's Throw, he and I got together and talked about it. We really wanted to do a charitable event or component, so we do what we call eat like a chef, drink like a psalm. So since February of 2014, every month we invite a guest chef to come in and we do a five course tasting menu the last Monday of every month. Uh, we do half the menu, they do half the menu, um, and all the proceeds go to a charity. We pick one charity per year, so last year was the food bank. Uh, this year we chose Ronnie Lott's All Stars Helping Kids. And then we kind of evolved from there with Ronnie Lott being on board, hoping most of you know who Ronnie Lott is, Hall of Fame 49er, Super Bowl hero, Everybody et cetera. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Cut off a finger in a game Money. to win a Super Bowl, et cetera. Um, he, we've kind of introduced athletes into the mix. So we had last month was Boulevard was the guest restaurant. Joe Montana was the guest athlete. And the idea behind the event is it's designed for people like us. It's younger professionals who don't want to go to a gala dinner, who don't want to spend $500 a plate. And the idea was we can teach the next generation how to give back by saying you can come for $60 a person, have a five course dinner, whereas if you go anywhere else in San Francisco for dinner, like I did last night, you'll spend way more than $60. Um, and here all the money goes to the charity. So the year to date, this year we've already donated $30,000 just from doing eight events or nine events for it. And we have two more upcoming. So if you're looking for an interesting event, this month is Kim Alter from uh, Dana Patterson's group, Plum Haven. She's opening a new project on her own. And then Michael Mina is actually doing uh, the one in November to finish up the year for us. Great. Thank you. Super exciting. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so um, back into the dish right now, like we've gotten to the point where like, we're, baby, we're basically ready to assemble the whole thing. If you were going to do this for a party, you're ready to go. Uh, you're ready to cook for your friends uh, without sweating a lot, which is nice. Um, and I'll kind of just bring it all back together just to make sure that we're all there. So, trying to make sure this is the right place. So, again, we've made the sauce. We have pasta. It's blanched. It's ready to go. Um, all the shellfishes that we want, love, ready to eat. Uh, the same piri piri. So we're just going to kind of refortify that flavor. The more sliced garlic. And you, know, you guys are going to see what we're going to do with that here in a second. Um, touch of butter and lemon juice. Lemon juice uh, is going to kind of just clean the whole dish up. You guys will see it here in a second. Um, and then the last one, which we didn't really get to, uh, for me, pasta dishes can become extremely like heavy, uh, very kind of mundane to eat, I guess. So one of the things that I really love is kind of a more fresh component. Um, so with here, or what we have here, is what's called peacock kale. Uh, we took out the stems, kind of made small little bites out of it. What it does is it lightly wilts, obviously, with the greens. You guys usually want to cook them down and maybe braise them, however so. Um, this is light enough, or it's sturdy enough to where it won't just kind of break apart and or become like a mess. Uh, but it's also um, light enough to where it's like if you lightly wilt it, give it just a little bit of heat. Um, it's really like pleasurable to eat. Uh, it also holds like sauces and things like that really well. So. Um, hot pan is what we have here. And add just a touch of oil. A lot of people are actually afraid to cook like with oil. Not in the sense of like afraid I'm not gonna use oil. But usually the problem with cooking at home is people don't use like enough. Not that you need to fill the whole bottom, but it definitely helps in the cooking process. So hopefully I'm using this right. So with the pan more so on the uh, the higher side of heat. Sliced garlic. Okay has this nice sound, you know you're doing something right. And what we're gonna do is, not quite, we're not gonna burn it, but we're gonna toast it. And what that does is it's gonna add this kind of really distinct flavor. Um, 
That's really kind of just distinct, especially to this dish for us. And for me, that's kind of like the way I like to cook. You try to, to layer a lot of flavors, be it what's salty, what's sweet in the dish, um, what's the richness, you know, what's the acid component. It's almost like formula cooking, but it's just the idea of how do you balance out a dish. So as you guys can see, it's really starting just to get brown now. We're going to go just a little bit longer. It's just kind of the point where you don't want to necessarily walk away from it. Do you have any go-to ingredients to elevate a dish's flavor? Like your favorite? My favorite, like literally, honestly, onions, as dumb as that sounds, actually add a layer of flavor. Um, that's kind of just the most apparent. That and shallots. Um, and then I'm a huge spice freak, not in the sense of things being spicy, but just spices and spice blends and things like that. So what we've done is we've added the shellfish or all the, the seafood. We're gonna add in a couple of our chilies. Again, more so however you want it to taste. Again, you want it spicy, get crazy. Kind of breaking them in here. Give that a stir. Now we're gonna add our sauce. Giving myself a little steam bath. <laughs> we're gonna add in our pasta. Again, this is already cooked. So now we're just looking to kind of warm it through. We're gonna add just, just everybody close their eyes for two seconds. <laughs> just just a, a touch of butter. I'll save one in there. You guys didn't close your eyes. Why do you add it at the end like that? So what you're gonna try to do, butter is fat fat emulsifies. So what we're trying to do is make this like a rich kind of glazy pasta, um, which helps with the addition. That's the sequence of steps with it kind of helps make its own sauce as opposed to having a big pot of like this creamy sauce. Uh, you're kind of just making the sauce in itself or in the pan. They're adding chilies back there. It's going to hit you guys here in a few seconds. So if this side starts coughing, you guys are safe, I promise. <laughs> If you guys really take a look, it's like, before it was just liquid, now it's starting to have this viscosity. One more chili. Does everybody see that? Now it's more of like a sauce in here as opposed to just water. Oh, I gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Pinch of salt. Taste your food. Make sure it's what you like. Do you need it? <laughs> <laughs> Always. It's going to be good. So the last two things to go in, to the point where we're almost there, are going to be the greens and not the cooking oil, lemon juice. For me, I add the, the kale first, because I want to just give it just a little bit to wilt down. With the kale being raw, I've already tasted it. I know I just want to touch more salt because of what the flavor of this is. This burner doesn't like that.
As you guys can notice, again, that's starting just to break down itself. If anybody's offended by butter, I'm sorry. <laughs> can I ask, um, so this, everyone keeps saying it's very simple, but when I think about making this at home, I think this is more of like a Saturday night type of dish, I think. I like your Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have things like kind of go-to favorites that you make at home that are I'm super simple easy? at home. Like for me, I love roasted chicken. As dumb as that sounds, it's like the day you make like the perfect roasted chicken, it's kind of that... Oh, yeah, I'm going to make it again and again. Um, I love simple foods. I love one pot um, dishes, stews, my favorite. Actually, kind of my go-to, um, two go-tos in that style. Anybody been to Olive Garden? Cheesy. I love Olive Garden. I make that soup all the time. I'm a jerk. I love that stuff. It's potatoes. It's sausage. It's kale. It's rich. It's hearty. Um, like that kind of thing. White bean stews. Like the, the base to it is great. Whether you want to go like chorizo and piquillos or you want to go sausage and lots of wine, who knows? Um, it's there, you know, and that's kind of my favorite part about cooking. So get a bowl by chance, chef. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Just to add to that question, um, for those of us here in the room, often have a lot of work demands and family demands and don't have a lot of time to cook at home. Do you have any recommendations or tips for how to go about that more efficiently so we can do Hire it in me. less time? Hire, Hire you? Hire oh, hey. All right. The, for me, I always love, it's always fun to cook. And so at the restaurants, we do what's called family meal. Family meal being the time where everybody gets together. It's right before service. We cook dinner for ourselves, basically. The fun thing about it is it's not the idea ever of necessarily cooking something that's fresh that day. The example of a roasted chicken is, hey, we may take a roasted, a bunch of roasted chickens. You know what I mean, is mm -hmm. the case. Great, we have roasted chicken, let's eat. I'm happy, I'm excited. We're not gonna eat it all. So what we did is we just basically prepped at that time for the next day. So if we pick the chicken after that, it may be chicken soup. You know what I mean, chicken and potato, chicken and kale, chicken and beans, I don't know whatever anybody's excited for. So that's kind of how we like to cook. I mean, so obviously. maybe you could do a big meal like on Sunday and exactly. stretch it out. Exactly. The uses of it anyway, over the week. So here are the dishes done. Lots of seafood. This is for everybody to share, just in case you guys. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna be enough. <laughs> That right there is just a fun bowl of pasta. So that's it. That looks so good. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. You can have the first one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Or? Any questions? Great. Does anyone have any questions? I'm always scared of these. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's okay. a good question. I went to Stone's Throw a while ago, and I remember uh, fondly that they had an option to um, give a suggestion for dessert. Yes. I was wondering what came of, came of that. We, so the question is, or I guess to um, expand the question, at Stone's Throw, what's really fun is um, I have a pastry chef. She's great. Uh, but what makes it fun for people to come in is uh, our desserts. And so our dessert program is um, after you finish your dinner, you can have dessert. Um, <laughs> what we do, it's so scary. Uh, what we do is we drop a menu on the bottom of the menu. We, our program is childhood favorites. What was your favorite childhood dessert? Mine was like, not necessarily dessert, but mine was like peanut butter and jelly. I love peanut butter and jelly, still do. What we ask for is a suggestion. What's your favorite childhood dessert? We ask for your email or your phone number. We'll give you a call if we choose it. Come in, try it, see what you think of our rendition of a dessert. So it's constantly evolving. Part of it has to deal with the season. Part of it has to deal with um, kind of just what's going on at that time. But if we choose it, you come in. You try it. Hopefully, you kind of relive a little bit of a, a childhood, uh, a little bit of your childhood, I guess. Um, current desserts right now are peanut butter and jelly. 
Uh, so we do uh, vanilla sugar dusted beignets. We do it with a little bit of uh, candied peanuts, a peanut cream, Concord grape gel, uh, and chocolate creme mousse. So the idea is really just grab a donut, kind of get dirty with it and uh, enjoy it. Um, strawberry cheesecake is one of them right now. We have a blackberry crisp. And again, these are all kind of our versions. So it's not necessarily gonna be something where you get a plate and it's, ah, it's a blackberry crisp, thanks. Um, not necessarily that straightforward, but it makes it fun for us. So it's always evolving. Um, we have 2,000 suggestions. There's a lot of people with a lot of suggestions, uh, which is fun, but um, that's kind of what we do. So <laughs> anything else? You have a question out there? Um, I have a question about making the pasta, because I saw during when you were making the pasta, there were two different hats that you chose. What's the difference between those for like blending the flour and the squid ink? Say that again? My apologies. So I remember during the presentation, there was a time that you changed the head of the blender. Oh, yes. What's the difference between those two? So, um, um, so one was a paddle. One is the uh, dough hook itself. So the paddle, um, the dough hook, there's really no, there's nothing to it. It's the hook. It's going to grab something that's already made and kind of move it around. The paddle itself, the reason we did that is because you have a lot of raw ingredients, which is going to help bring them all together. We got it to a certain point where it's there, um, or that it actually started to come together. And then you're going to want to just kind of like check the moisture. But as you can tell, like it's dough now. What we try to do with the hook then is use the hook to kind of um, to knead the dough. Okay, kind of starting all the glutens and to make the dough come together to give it some, some uh, structure. Um, for this dough, it does take a little while to come together, uh, which makes it, it makes the dough what it is. Um, if it was super, like we could add a ton of water in here, it would come together in two seconds. Uh, but then you're gonna have kind of this really soft pasta that's more like an overcooked noodle before you even cook it. So that's kind of what the, uh, how the two work together. So. If you don't have a kitchen aid, is it very hard to make your own pasta? It's not, it's more like a workout. <laughs> um, I've actually worked in a kitchen where I wasn't allowed to use this, uh, which was fun. Got really big right arm. Uh, <laughs> so no, it's actually, it's, it's a little bit more work. You tend to, um, it just takes a little bit more work, that's it. Anything done by hand. Honestly, kind of the motto is it's going to take a little bit more work no matter what. So uh, it's honestly a lot of fun to make pasta by hand, especially this style. Um, again, with this, the I think you guys have the recipe to the pasta dough. If you wanted to make it or you didn't have squid ink, it's the exact same thing. All you're doing is adding a touch of water to this flour. It's two ingredients, flours and water. And uh, pretty straightforward from there. So. And can you talk a little bit about the advantages of fresh pasta versus, say, a dried pasta? I'm not biased to either. Uh, so fresh pasta, um, we'll start here. Dried pasta, generally, we're buying it. I don't have to make anything. It's kind of nice. Um, what's really actually nice about dried pastas, for me, is there's a little bit more um, time cooking. So for me, if there's more time to cook something, I get to do a little bit more in terms of flavor and texture and you're going to notice those kind of things. So if I wanted, if I had a great, I had grandma's tomato sauce, I might cook the dried tomato or the dried pasta for a little while. Um, three quarters of the time that it, it's supposed to say on the box. I'm going to take it and add it to grandma's sauce and use that to cook it more. All of a sudden my pasta has absorbed more of that sauce as opposed to water, butter and cheese. So that's kind of one huge aspect. With uh, fresh pastas, you can manipulate it more so in the style of what it is. Uh, sheets, raviolis, things like that. You can't really do that with a dried pasta. Uh, so there's a lot of things. It's really kind of just due to the scenario in which you're in, so. Great. thanks. So I guess going off with that question. So uh, there are so-called fresh pastas from stores or grocery stores, like? Uh -huh. What's the difference between those fresh pastas versus uh, if we make them at home? One costs you six ninety nine, and the other one, 
cost you nothing. <laughs> they, they're, it's the same process. They're really just doing it in the industrial size. Uh, honestly, they, there's some great products out there. People that are making stuff. Yeah, what's fun, I think nowadays, there's kind of the market for people wanting the example to cook a great meal. You know what I mean? They don't have the capacity necessarily to necessarily make everything from scratch themselves. And so you have this market that people are putting their heart into a product for you. So you like to do that, take advantage of that, have a good time. It makes cooking a little bit more fun and uh, touch more desirable when you're not having to stress about everything. Like, hey, if I go buy a fresh sheet of pasta and I wanna make raviolis, all the power to you, have fun with it, you know? So, that's all right. Well, thank you again, Chef Jason Halverson for joining us. Um, hope to see you again here Absolutely. at Google. Thanks for having us, thank you. Thank you.